Steve, concerning songs, I was reminded uh, from this morning of something that occurred with me back when I was at Burristown Church of Christ. Now, Burristown is, as you're going out of Gainesburg and you're headed out toward Hillham and think you're going to go all the way maybe to Livingston or something, so Burristown is up there on top of the hill, just past Columbus Hill. Anyway, I was the preacher over there at Burristown. And I was going through in a singing or something one night that we were having. And you know where you think you know a, a song. And you're looking at it. One time, I just was talking off the top of my head. There was a statement in a song about the pilgrim's lurking foe. Well, the problem was, is my eyes weren't working right. And I was just a young fellow at the time. And I don't know if I didn't know the word lurking or whatever. And I looked at it. And where it said, pilgrim's lurking foe. And I said, brethren. I said, this one's got a new word in it. I don't know this one. I was standing up there in front of him. I said, what's a slurking foe? A pilgrim slurking foe. What is that? I, I didn't have the right letters associated with it or anything. Of course, I was just a young preacher at the time. And the, uh, the whole congregation there, they don't want to be rough on you. But, uh, you know, the, uh, some of the older ones are just like, oh, this is a college boy. You know. So... Anyway, you never forget those little incidences like that, but I'm able, glad we were able to pick up with another good song. Uh, when you look at some of the things I want to talk to you about this morning, I'm going to relate different little incidences of people's life and everything, make it something that you can understand where I'm coming from, because the subject is one that, ah, it's kind of a little bit philosophical, you might say. It's getting you ready for next week, Lord willing. If Jesus doesn't come before next week, then what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to preach next week on Sunday morning on hell and on Sunday night on heaven. The reason I'm going to do that is really very plain. Sunday morning, I want to preach on the subject of hell so that I feel like I have the right to preach on the subject of heaven Sunday night. Most of the time, the crowd on Sunday night, you expect, they ought to expect to go to heaven anyway, and so I figured that's the best time to preach on it. I really have a hard time preaching on both subjects at the same time. And I don't see Jesus doing a whole lot of that, although he mentions both of them, both concepts, and I'll be doing that as well. Like Matthew 25 and verse 46, the righteous go into eternal life, but the disobedient are punished with everlasting destruction, right? Isn't that how it mentions the contrast between both of them? And I don't want to waste a whole lot of time next Sunday morning, if next Sunday morning comes, and say... Well, here's all the ways in which I want to apologize for preaching on something that comes straight out of the Bible. I don't see Jesus doing that. Do you notice him ever doing that kind of thing in the Scripture? And I don't see the Lord also giving a big bunch of exceptions every time he preached. Let me give you an example on that. When Jesus was talking to the scribes and Pharisees, and we're going to be looking at Matthew 23 in a moment, so you might want to be turning there. Matthew chapter 23. When he was fussing at them, he said, Scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Now, you all that know your Bible here, you know that in the Bible you have the Apostle Paul. He was not a hypocrite. Even when he was persecuting the church, he was doing what he thought should be done, didn't he? I know he was. He thought he ought to be that way. He wasn't a hypocrite, but Jesus said, that the Pharisees were hypocrites. Well, Paul was a Pharisee, and he's not a hypocrite. Why didn't Jesus mention the exception? It's because you don't have to mention the exception. There's an old expression. If the shoe fits, wear it. When I'm preaching on hell, I'm not preaching about you going there if you're not going. If I'm preaching on a Bible to topic like hell, then I'm preaching to those to whom it fits, aren't I? And everybody should know that. Jesus did exactly the same thing in Matthew 23. Furthermore, one of the reasons why people are uncomfortable about the preacher preaching on hell is because they have no concept of the justice or the fairness of God. And that's what I'm going to preach to you about this morning. They just don't have any concept of it. Some people are real fuzzy in their idea as to whether they're lost or saved. And they want to live perpetually in the no man's land. Now, how can I describe the no-man land of limbo? I want to describe it to you like this. Yeah, I'll start over here. Well, it's got a daughter-in-law fuss at me if I don't use this as the good side anyway. Okay, besides, I seem to remember I picked on, uh, remember when I had the young people separate that one Sunday evening and I had Ben stand over here and he was everything bad, you know, and he kept getting worse and backing up. So this time we'll have the good over here. 
So let's say you've got the very best, the cream of the crop, the further you get over to the edge. Y'all like that, don't you? Yeah, just right here. And as you travel along, you still got people that are headed in the right direction, but they're maybe just not, uh, you know, maybe not as good as these over here, but they're pretty good people. And then in here, you all are just in limbo land. Y'all ever heard of limbo? That means you just, you're not the bad, you're not the good, you're just kind of in limbo, you're sort of in between, and who knows what's going to happen to you. But I got something to say about that, just hang on. And then you got the group over here, I'm sorry, somebody's got to be the scapegoat, okay? You start out and you have some issues. And maybe you're planning, you know, to go out Friday night and get in just a little bit of trouble. Uh, maybe Brother Wilder has a mailbox he wants to knock over somewhere, somewhere, you never know. You. And, and then you go from there, and by the time you work it all the way over here, then you're just, you're in with, uh, you know, Osama bin Laden and Hitler and the whole bunch. Sorry, it's just, it, it's bad over here. It's real bad. Okay, so... You got the full range of human existence. And the problem that people have is that they seem to think that God has these arbitrary cutoff points. And then he just slices it up. And on the day of judgment, who knows whether you're going to be found in the limbo land group where God just says, well, all right, they started making a dividing line right here. I'll just let this half go in with that bunch and that half. You know, you're out of luck. And he throws you over here. And this bunch over here, he says, well, maybe you weren't near as good as this bunch over here, but ah, go ahead, go on in, you know, I don't want to deal with it. And over here, he says, uh, well, you know, maybe it wasn't all that bad. The mailbox was about to fall over anyway, but it wasn't good. So you just, oh, you just go in with the worst people that ever did anything and throws them all in, into the bad place. That is not how God looks at it. It's not how he does it. It's not how the Bible pictures it. God is a just God. He is fair. And he will do everything according to the exact way that is right. Now, I want to stress that to you, and I want to really press the point home by showing you some of these Bible passages this morning. Look at that Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew 23, the Lord clearly lays down to us the principle of God's righteousness. This is the hardest sermon in Matthew 23 that ever was preached. It is a harder sermon than the one I'll be presenting next Sunday morning on the subject of hell. By the way, I'm not trying to scare anybody away. If you love the Bible and you want plenty of it and you rejoice in the righteousness of God, then you ought to come tomorrow, uh, next Sunday morning and uh, hear what it is that the Bible has to say about it. You ought to make plans to come on uh, the next Sunday night where I look forward to talking to you all about the glories and the beauty of heaven. Anyway, if you look in here in this Matthew chapter 23, Jesus, like I said before, he didn't apologize for it. He knew how they were, and Jesus knew what people needed to hear. And when he started in, in verse 13, and waded into the scribes and Pharisees, he told them repeatedly, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! And remember, he would make statements to them like, You make them twofold more a child of hell than even yourselves, when he talked about making the proselytes. And then you look at some of the statements that he gave to them, and it clearly shows that the Lord believes, now here comes a big idea. Some of y'all, I don't know how much you've heard of it before. You may have heard somebody speculate about it. I'm telling you, the Bible definitely teaches it. He taught degrees of punishment. All right, you get to heaven. When I get to heaven... Am I going to be disappointed because I don't appreciate it like the Apostle Paul? See, that's not going to be an issue, is it? Does that mean I expect to receive the same blessings as David and the Apostle Paul and people like that? No, but I'm going to be there with them. Now, you all think with me for a moment. I haven't sacrificed like that man. You think that I have experienced the wonder and was entrusted with the care and responsibility that the blessed uh, mother of our Lord was given, Mary? Am I going to appreciate heaven as much as her? Think with me for a moment. I don't have any problem with degrees of blessings. A little baby passes on and goes on to be with the Lord. 
God takes them to heaven, doesn't he? That's right. Takes them all to heaven. They didn't have to decide on Jesus. God takes care of them. But you think that they experience heaven in the same way as someone who consciously decided to place their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and live faithfully for him? They're all in the same place. But every part of heaven is nothing less than eternal fellowship and bliss with God. Every part of hell is nothing less than eternal separation from God. But if you are going to act like the just God of heaven looks at mankind and says, everybody is a Hitler, everybody's an Osama bin Laden, everybody is Genghis Khan. No, God doesn't do that. Little sweet grandma that was guilty of being stubborn. She never would come to the right way of the Lord. You telling me God's going to judge her in the same way? Don't get me wrong. The just God says that every bit of hell is nothing less than separation from him forever. But God will judge people according to what is right. Let's look in Matthew 23. As he is giving these sections of condemnation, the first one I mentioned to you is in verse 13. See that? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Each section is given a different heading of that same statement. And then he gives them a different condemnation each time. Look at the second one in verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. So here's his second condemnation to them. You devour widows' houses and for a pretense you make long prayer. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. A man tells me, he says, well, I don't know, I hope it works out for me on the day of judgment. And this is why our denominational friends think badly of us. Because you ask one of them, say, you going to heaven? They say, I know I'm going to heaven whether they really know it or not. Why do they say that? Because at least they understand the principle in Scripture that a man should be able to know whether he's right with God. And a man can know whether or not he's done something awful before God. They shall receive the greater condemnation, the greater damnation. Why does he say that? Because you take somebody over here and he's maybe not what he ought to be but he would never take advantage of a widow lady. And you take some of those who are just as rough and as mean and they have connived and they have planned and they have deceived and they have done every single thing that they could in order to get themselves ahead and they didn't care who they hurt along the way in life. And what does Jesus say about them? He says, there is a greater damnation and you're going to get it. Now, if it doesn't exist, he wouldn't have said so. I don't know how many times you all have heard about this, but people misunderstanding this is why they don't understand that God is fair and God is just. When you get before him on the day of judgment, you won't get anything that's not coming to you. Not a thing. And if you have been cleansed in the precious blood of Jesus Christ, my friends, then you are justified before him. You don't wonder and say, well, I hope it might be okay in the day of judgment. You don't wonder about that. Did Jesus' blood maybe, sort of, kind of forgive you? Or were you cleansed completely and totally by the blood of Christ? If you know it, my friend, then you know it. There is a sharp division between the two. There is no limbo with God. But among those that do good, not everybody does as good. Among those who do bad, not everybody does as bad. And when you get on the day of judgment, God will separate the sheep and the goats according to what is just, according to what is right. And God doesn't do it arbitrarily, and God does it according to the way that he sees fit. Let's go to another Bible passage. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus deals exactly with this principle. Luke 12, beginning at verse 47, talking about how just God is, how fair he is. He's good. He knows how to deal with people. 
Here's what Jesus said. The servant which knew to do his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his Lord's will, shall be beaten with many stripes. God, are you going to get him? God says yes, and he's going to be got bad. He knew what he needed to do, and he didn't do it. But he who did not know and did commit things worthy of stripes, he shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him much shall be required. And of whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Tim, are you saying to me this morning that people get away with it that are born over in the African bush and they don't know any better? I'm not saying that at all. If they don't obey the gospel, they are lost. The fact of the matter is, though, is that God will look at them on the day of judgment, and even though they will not get to live in eternity with him, it's not going to be as harsh a judgment as what's coming against Americans. I know that. Jesus said so. I don't know how God's going to take care of that. I don't have to. I put myself totally, all my soul is in his keeping. He will do what is right. And I put full confidence in that. If God tells me that, Tim, you get you a little bitty mansion, a little cottage in the corner, yes, Lord, you have done what is good and right. Thank you. And if he says you receive an abundant entrance into a blessedness which you cannot even begin to imagine and which cannot even be expressed in words, thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. I can know whether or not I'm in but exactly how's God going to deal with that? I don't know. I know the limbo land doesn't really exist. God is a just God, and he knows the difference between his children and those who are not. He'll know exactly how to divide everybody up that's kind of in the muddled masses that are, you know, some good and some bad. God knows how to deal with that. But when you look back at this passage and you see that there are people in America, and we are awash in Bible. Y'all have Bibles right here. I can hear you turning the pages. Some of y'all show me your Bibles. You got Bibles? Yeah, I see some there. Good, good. Yeah, I see Bibles. See, they're all over here. You know how many people in the world would give themselves and everything they have many times over so that they could just get a hold of one of those Bibles that people talk about. One of those things that explains about Jesus. Or if they could just read and they knew how to learn more about Jesus. God says, are they responsible for doing what is right? Of course they are. But when they don't do what is right, God says, I'll punish them, but they'll be beaten with few stripes. He said, there are those of us who knew to do what's right. We're blessed in a land flowing with milk and honey. God says, you are responsible. And you'll answer before me. Oh, that's a scary thought, isn't it? It scares me. It makes you shake deep down that I have been given everything in life, blessed with the knowledge that Jesus reigns and secure in the knowledge that the Lord is leading us as the most blessed of all people and the greatest nation upon the face of the earth, living like nobody else gets to live, looking around in every house you go to, well, there's another Bible laying right there on the coffee table. Well, there's another picture of Jesus. Tell me some more about him. Well, I have freedom. I can talk about him all day long and nobody comes and tries to prosecute me or persecute me in any form or fashion. We are in the place of responsibility. That's why it's our job to export the gospel. That's why it's our job to have more laid on us and do more because if we don't, we shall receive, just like those scribes and Pharisees, the greater damnation. If we don't, we shall receive just like he mentions in the Bible, those who knew to do their master's will, but did it not, they shall be beaten with many stripes. It's a great responsibility. God is a just God. He's fair. Isn't that fair? If God's going to give you more stuff, that you have bigger responsibility. He gives us his word. He expects us to follow it. My friends, you go outside these doors this morning and you don't obey the gospel, then what excuse are you going to have? Now, they're all excuses. Everybody has to obey the gospel. But what excuse will you have? You can't say like that person over in the African bush, Oh, Lord, if I had just had a Bible. 
if somebody had just told me how much Jesus loves me in life. Nobody ever said anything to me. And I know I should have looked harder, but I just didn't know. Well, God will deal with them according to what's right. But when it comes to us, what are you going to say? We can't say any of that, can we? You've got Bible preached on TV. You've got Bible preached over the radio. You've got the Lord Jesus proclaimed as Lord among those who don't even understand Him. And yet even those who are out there trying to get Christians in trouble, they still will have that sweet name flow from their lips. And just like the Apostle Paul said, whether it is sincere or insincere from them, either way, the name of Jesus is out there and Christ is glorified and everything is better because of it. You're living in a land where we have freedom to express ourselves that way. And you're going to go before God on the day of judgment, the just and fair judge of the world, and not do the simplest of things to serve him. You see, that's where we get to thinking real serious. There was a man that I was talking recently to my Wednesday night young men's class about. His name is Danny. And I don't know how much I've told you all about him before, but he is the only man whom I've ever met that literally begged me to help him. You want to talk about feeling a sense of obligation. When you have somebody, and I walked into his hospital room, and one of her last acts of evangelism was Sister Laura Key told me, on her deathbed, there's somebody you need to go see in that room over there. It was Danny. And when I went over there and saw him, then he got to talking to me. He didn't know me. Didn't know me from Adam. And just gets to pouring his heart out to me. He had been raised to where he knew what the church was. He knew what God had expected of him in life and had never paid attention to God like he should have. Oh, he had played the game like a lot of people. Tried to be a responsible dad. Tried to you know, keep up the appearances of just a regular American life and everything. But he knew, I have not done according to the teachings of that book. And now I'm getting weak. He could feel his life force ebbing from him. He's not getting any better. He needs to put his house in order. And he doesn't even know if they're going to let him ever out of that hospital. They did end up letting, letting him out of the hospital, but he didn't know. And so he was desperate. When he spoke to me, he opened up to a pure stranger. And he begged me. He said, you've got to help me. He said, you promised me you will help me. I have never seen a man so desperate. I've never seen a man lower himself like that. To that extent, he was scared to death. Not because he thought he was serving a God that didn't love him, but because he knew in life that he had not returned that love to God and that he had never humbled himself in obedience to the Lord. So the least he could do is humble himself before man and say, you please help me. Now you want to talk about somebody scurrying around. I could not rest. Why can we not get this man moved over to another room over here where they have that whirlpool and everything? Well, he's got a port in him. He can't be moved. He can't be done this or that. Well, let's get a hold of this. Talk to the doctor. I knew that fella. Let's talk to that doctor. I'll get old Dr. Michael. We'll, we'll talk. We'll get it worked out or something. Well, sure enough, after you, if you're heavy enough with a doctor, don't keep him in the water any longer than you have to. That's fine, doc. You see what he said? Close that port up. Get him ready. Prep him. Now, what, what kind of whirlpools you got over here? That one ain't big enough. You got another one? Yeah, this one's got some machinery in it. I got to get that machinery out of this. Can I take this out of that? I want to take this out of there, okay? I'm going to take it out of there. And so <laughs> you grab it and I was getting that whirlpool fan and everything and throwing it out of there. How are we going to do this? How many nurses are going to help me? How many people are going to show up and get this done? You want to talk about lighting a fire under somebody. When somebody humbles themselves before God, he looks upon them in mercy. He looks upon them and he's kind to them and good, just like the Bible describes. Danny, maybe you didn't live a life that 
I designed for you. You wasted your talents. You didn't do really like you ought to have done. But now your family has seen that you have humbled yourself before me. And he obeyed the gospel and he was satisfied. And it wasn't too many weeks after that that he went on to meet his Lord. And it wasn't too many weeks after that until his widow and his son obeyed the gospel. He being dead still spoke and influenced people more in his death than he ever did in life because he finally humbled himself before the Lord, because he finally recognized, I'm going to go and appear before the God of justice. What's he going to do with my soul? Well, I can't speak as to, as to the specifics of what he'll do with souls, but I do know that God says there's two places. There's heaven and there's hell. And every soul that is dealt with by God, whether they are the best of the best or the worst of the worst, God will do exactly what is right by them, won't he? And he won't give to anybody anything more than what they should have got. And he won't leave off anything from anybody less than what they should have received. People have an unhealthy attitude toward judgment, and that's what I want to finish with this morning. In Romans chapter 8, and in verse 37, Romans 8, verse 37, Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Such a beautiful passage. Nobody can separate us from the love of Christ. Nobody can do anything to God's children that will make the Lord deal unfairly with me. He will do what is right by me. And if I don't give up on him, he will never give up on me. So when I ask people in the church, are you saved? Why can they not say, yes, I am saved? Why are they are not? They always want to throw in the wishes and the hopes and, the, and this, that, and the other. And when they say hope, they don't mean Bible hope. The Bible hope is an expectation of the reward that we shall receive. They mean kind of wish like once I wish upon a star. That's not how the Bible pictures it. Doesn't matter what's happening to you in this life, he says. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In Revelation chapter 22, you look at the very end of the Bible, and in that very last chapter, very last verses, it says in verse 12, Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. What will God do? He will give to every man as their work shall be. God will be fair with them. And so what did John say about that? Well, Lord, I'm still a little worried about my soul. If you'll give me a few more days, just don't come yet. We feel like that, don't we? I'm not going to lie to you. I feel like that. But that's not how John expressed it. John said, Lord, you say you're going to come? You come quickly. He which testifies of these things says, verse 20, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. John said, I'm ready, didn't he? Come on. It's time. You want to bring your judgment? It is always time for your judgment, Lord. You know what is best. You say you're coming again? Come on. Come on. Oh, if we could all just have that attitude. Many of us may have an unhealthy attitude about judgment, but not the Lord and not his true followers. My friends, the judgment is not something to be scared of for those who have known Jesus Christ. It is not something to wonder, what will the cruel taskmaster of Egypt give us? No, God is the loving God who extends to us the olive branch of peace in Jesus Christ and who says to us that everybody can know the peace of God who comes to him in faithful obedience. If there's anyone here this morning and you have ever had a bad attitude about God and you've ever thought that God was being unfair with you or you never realized that we're going to have to go and to meet the God of judgment who knows everything you ever did and will know all the good and all the bad and he'll know how to weigh them in the balances. Every man according to his word. God will give a righteous judgment. And if you're prepared before him, then my friends, get ready to go to heaven. Get ready to listen next Sunday night 
because if he hasn't come before that time, then we're going to study on some beautiful things, some interesting things about heaven itself. If you're not prepared, then do you realize you go to the judge of all the earth? And do you live in a place where you can say, well, Lord, I got these excuses? Or do you live in a place where you know the truth is right there in front of your face? Where you've heard it Sunday after Sunday and where you know I'd better obey God now because I'm going to meet him. And I need to have that assurance of heaven. If there's any way that we can help you, won't you come to Jesus Christ? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Won't you come to him now as we stand and sing?